Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, hello. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say it's a pleasure to talk to a fellow Bronx High School of Science alum. So Is that right? Okay. I think I'm a little older than you. <laughs> Just yeah, a little. Class, class of 2001 here, uh -huh. <laughs> but but it's it's such a it's such a bonding thing. Like whenever I hear someone you know went to Bronx Science, I always that's something I always lock into. <laughs> you missed my commencement speech from 2000. Oh yes, that, I would have. That would have been a year before before I graduated. Yeah, I titled that one "Revenge of the Nerds." <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, it's clearly working. I mean, you, you're clearly doing very well for yourself, and, and nerds these days are, are doing very well for themselves. So I, we seem to be in a golden age of nerds. Yeah, yeah, geek chic. Maybe it should have always been that. And Because uh, to say golden age implies that one day it will no longer be the golden age. I'd like to think that it's achieved the place in society that it has always deserved and that it will eternally retain. I, I hope so as well, and uh, you know it's 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 certainly helped by by shows like uh, a Star Talk, which you host on National Geographic Channel, of course, uh, mm -hmm. which is a science-based mm -hmm. talk show. Uh, with, and it started as a radio show and a podcast before it moved to uh, you know before you started doing it for Nat Geo. Uh, what what how did that opportunity come about to to bring it to to that network? Yeah, like I said, it's it's like as you said, it started as a radio show, basically by a grant from the National Science Foundation. We approached them. It's I and two other sort of co-partners in this exercise, uh, Helen Matzos and at the time, uh, David um, uh, David Gamble. And we proposed to the National Science Foundation that we had an idea about how to bring science to the public, not just in the way that had happened before, because you can create a science show and people who are interested in science then tune in. For us, the question was, can we create a show where people who don't know that they like science tune in, or better yet, people who know they don't like science would tune in. And what we did was we inverted the traditional model of the journalist interviewing a scientist. And in this case, I am the host, and I'm interviewing people who have nothing, typically have nothing to do with science. And the conversation is all about the ways that science has touched their lives. And if my guest is hewn from pop culture, then they will have a following because if you're a pop culture icon, your people who follow you follow you wherever you go. And they then follow their person to a conversation about science. And that's what happens on Star Talk. And so our, our following grew. We started out in terrestrial radio and then uh, jumped to podcast. And the numbers just kept growing. Meanwhile, I had to do Cosmos with uh, Fox and National Geographic. So that I had to sort of break for a bit. We did Cosmos, and National Geographic said, you know, we like doing Cosmos with you. Is there any other TV you want to do? And I said, no, <laughs> not really. <laughs> but if you're going to do any TV with me at all, why not film my radio show? And there are plenty of filmed radio shows that are sort of mysteriously successful. It's just the person behind a desk with a microphone Right? They're talking about sports or, or whatever. And so I knew it could work even in that base form. But if you add some extra TV production values, it could take on a whole other identity. So, uh, so they agreed. And so Nat Geo stepped in. And now they, they broadcast, they create 20 Star Talk TV versions of the 50 shows we do a year, there's one, one a week. But so they cherry pick uh, which topics they want to then turn into the TV show. And then we, we film it at the Hall of the Universe of the American Museum of Natural History, right under the Hayden Sphere, the Hayden Planetarium. So it's got all the cosmic romance that you would want in something that would make it to television. Uh, so there might be a day where they want to broadcast all of our 50 shows, but basically we're still doing it the radio and, uh, and, and podcast, and we're now on Sirius XM radio. So we're all very happy with the way things have, have turned out. As you mentioned, the, uh, the show blends, uh, uh, you know, science and scientists with, uh, with uh, entertainers and pop culture. And, and there's always been that relationship between science and pop culture, I think, you know, in, in science fiction and in the work of people like Carl Sagan, Isaac Asimov, certainly. Uh, but it doesn't seem, does it seem, you know, like in the last decade or so, public curiosity into science has, has really kind of boomed, and, and, and what might be the cause of that? Yeah, I, I, first I agree. Uh, I'll, I'll word it a little differently, but I fundamentally agree with what you said. I think science is trending in pop culture, and 
and uh, there are many indicators of this. Uh, I don't know that I've numerically measured this, but I can just tell you things that com make complete sense once they're all laid out on the table. You just look at, for example, you, variously the number one show on television, I think in any genre, but certainly in the sitcom genre, is The Big Bang Theory. Now, though they be caricatures, uh, nonetheless, there we all know geeks who resonate with characters portrayed in that show on some level. And they have a PhD physicist as their daily advisor on what equations to put on the on the boards in the background, what how, how they will speak their lines. And so there's a certain scientific authenticity to their caricatures that make the show, uh, that contribute, I think, to the show's popularity. And they have many, many sort of cameo appearances of known scientists, Stephen Hawking among them. So that adds another dimension of authenticity, that they might be real characters in a real world uh, because the scientists that step in, and I, I even had a cameo briefly. They never invited me back. <laughs> so, I, I think we both knew that I, I don't know how to act. So, uh, you know, generally you'll give some, some, some width for a cameo appearance of someone who's not an actor, right? Because it's just sort of fun to see them. But uh, there are others who were invited back multiple times, and they're way better actors than I am. Uh, even as scientists or engineers or astronauts. So Mike Massimino, for example, is a NASA astronaut, now retired. Uh, we have him often as a as a in-studio expert commenting on the interview that we conduct. He's been on Big Bang Theory multiple times uh, when one of the characters went into space. So that was just fun. But anyway, so you have that. You have, just look at the run of science fiction films that have featured first-run actors playing in those roles. And these have science advisors. In some cases, scientists are one of the producers or executive producers. Just go down the list and you have the, the Martian and Gravity and Interstellar. Then you have the biopics of, of the imitation game and a theory of everything, the theory of everything. And just a, a, combine that with the fact that Cosmos aired in primetime on a major network, Fox, on a Sunday night, and then aired in 181 countries on the National Geographic Network around the world in 47 languages. Combine all that together, and I don't know that there's any other way to say it. Science is trending. And I think it's trending in the younger population, like 35 and younger, maybe less so for the older generation. And But th this is the these are the folks who will lead the world give it another 10, 15 years. So I think this bodes well for the fostering of a scientifically literate civilization, which we will need for our own survival. Now, uh, on Star Talk, you know, you've had the opportunity to, uh, to interview a, a wide variety of guests, as, as you've mentioned, from, from all walks of life, uh, including uh, uh, you know, former President Bill Clinton recently, uh, uh, you know, this past season. Uh, that, that was a pretty extensive interview, and all, all the interviews you do, are, you know, a lot of them are, are fairly uh, in-depth. Uh, how long were you able to actually just sit down and, and talk, with, you know, talk science with Bill Clinton? Yeah, one of the, one of the, the tactics that we invoke when we create a show is I'm always on the prowl for a good interview wherever, wherever and whenever I can get it. And so I, then I summon up the, the, there's a crack team of camera folks that will respond almost on a moment's notice. If I happen to be in some city, I find out someone is there. We get some back room and we do the interview. Once we have the interview and we talk about anything that, connect science to their life or their livelihood, then we have this body of content. Afterwards, we say, oh, this would make a good bit. This makes a good bit. Let's take these bits, cut it into our studio broadcast. And in studio, we bring in typically an academic expert to respond. So let's go back to the season before we had Jimmy Carter, former President Carter. Well, as we know, his whole post-presidential life has been devoted to humanitarian causes. And among them, most recently, is to rid the world of parasites that infect humans uniquely. And if you get rid of them, then they're gone forever from our species, certain kinds of parasites. And so he himself, while he's 
probably pretty knowledgeable about parasites. He's not an academic expert. So in my interview with him, I, we took the best bits. And in studio, I brought in a colleague of mine from the American Museum of Natural History, who's an expert on parasites. And so anytime President Carter mentioned something, we'd come back to the studio. So what did he mean by that? Well, there's a whole category of these, and they infect this way, and here's their vector as they move through a population. And so these are the valves that we introduced to Star Talk. Oh, by the way, as you may know, we throw in a professional comedian in the mix. So I think of the academician as a, a valve of gravity and the, the, the comedian as a valve of levity. And I'm always, as host, adjusting these dials so that we deliver a a, a consistent product to the viewer. In the case of Clinton, uh, you know, he's his own show, basically. So, so one of my favorite comments from him was he had he had on loan from NASA a moon rock that he kept in the middle of his big meeting table in the Oval Office. And anytime the conversations got difficult or a little tense, he would just say, pause. That rock in the middle of the table is from the moon. <laughs> And people say, wow, oh my gosh, <laughs> just to just to layer a cosmic perspective on it. So yeah, it's it's fun talking about people, especially people who had wielded that much power over resources and funding and agencies, just to hear what their thinking was and had been, uh, is and had been on those topics. Yeah, that, that cosmic perspective. Uh, you know, when what I what I heard him talk about that was really really fascinating, and it, 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 I could really relate to that because you know, in, in a weird way, when I'm when I'm feeling anxious or nervous or something, I, I'll watch a Science Channel special on black holes to relax. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's how you know that you're. There's no turning back from that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, and it's just it's the the idea that there there is such large vast quantities and distances and and ideas in the universe that like anything on earth starts to feel pretty small and manageable at that point yeah and manageable it's the manageability factor that the cosmic perspective brings to us all or at least to put it in yes definitely manageable but to to rank what its level of importance is uh, you can overthink certain trauma in your life not to belittle what can be very serious trauma but little things you're late for something oh no but the universe is expanding and <laughs> just invoke some cosmic thinking and then you i think you can get through most of uh, life's trials and tribulations um yeah and, and, and the, the you know, talking to politicians and, and other experts in various fields you've talked about some of you know uh the the modern days most pressing issues like climate change and, and you've discussed the divide between science and politics. Uh, there seems to be a kind of wide gulf there right now. Uh, do you think as the public, uh, you know, is, is, you know, you know, more interested in science now and science is trending, uh, that it, it'll eventually keep moving, uh, governments in that direction too? Yeah. I think what you'll do is you'll age out the people who still think science is something to avoid or step around or to dig under or to just shield themselves from it on the premise that it's just some other topic like history or literature or Spanish, right? Without realizing that science drives civilization. It is the, it is, it is the foundation of the engines of tomorrow's economies. It's, it's not the same kind of academic subject as so many other topics that we've learned in school. Yet if you treat it just as that, then you'll you'll miss what role it actually needs to play in our health, our wealth, our, our security, our, our overall survival. So uh, I think we'll age out the people who didn't know any better. And this next generation, uh, I can't wait till they, they take charge. Uh, going back uh, to Cosmos, which you mentioned, uh, you made that uh, miniseries, which was uh, originally made by uh, Carl Sagan, uh, so famously in, in the 1980s. Uh, and those seemed like some pretty, pretty big shoes to fill. Uh, did that feel like a daunting task at, at the time you know, we started to develop that? No, not at all. I, I think it's a matter of outlook. Yes, if I, if I had to say to myself, I need to fill his shoes, yeah, that, I think that's essentially impossible. But that wasn't the, how I looked at it. I looked at it as, well, it's the 21st century, and we have more stories to tell about the universe and how it works and its relationship to us. And now I will be sharing those stories from, from, from a perspective that is modern. And so, 
So I see myself as filling different shoes, like my own shoes, and I can fill those perfectly. <laughs> and so if I'm going to fail in the role of host and executive editor, the roles that I played, then I would fail in my own shoes, not failing, attempting to fill the shoes of Carl Sagan. And not only that, the the writer and executive and, and co-executive producer, Andrewian, who co-wrote the original Cosmos and was Carl Sagan's widow, is Carl Sagan's widow, a, a brilliant woman and, and enlightened in particular. She's enlightened. Uh, she, you know, she brings the warmth and the heart and the and the the outlook to so much of the scripting that had happened in the original and in the new one. The uh, she knew she was writing for me. She knew she knew enough about who I am and what my styles are, and so uh, I think this all worked out. And she she uh, uh, so all that comes together in one sort of creative output. There are the 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 set designers, the music, the 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 person who designed the ship of the imagination. That's a badass ship. I don't know if you remember that. You know, I want a few of those parked out out back. <laughs> Who doesn't want one of those? So, so yeah, it's. Uh, I, I was delighted and honored to ascend to that mantle. Uh, one of the things that surprised me about uh, uh, Cosmos when I watched it was, you know, it's not just in, it's not just informative. It's not just a history of of the world and the natural world. It was also in, in unexpectedly moving in a way when you get the histories of past scientists and what they struggled with and barriers they tried to break and knowledge they tried to impart and weren't always well received. Uh, you know, d does it have that kind of emotional component for you too when when you know you consider uh, the history of science? Well what you notice is exactly uniquely what distinguishes Cosmos perhaps from other documentaries. There, there's no shortage of documentaries that have appeared since the original Cosmos up to today. And who doesn't love watching a good documentary? You watch it, they're informative, they're, they have good content, they fill gaps that you might have had. And okay, now you move on like to the next documentary or, or you do something else. It's not clear whether a documentary in its purest form infiltrates your sort of soul, your soul of, of living and of, of um, you know, your sense of your place in the universe and what it means. The, most documentaries are, 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 are more, are more uh, have, have, what's the best way to say it? Most documentaries are thinking less about you, the viewer, than they are about a body of content that they want to present to the viewer. Cosmos thinks about you and how you feel as a viewer. And it's that feeling that is what connects you in ways that you remember what you've seen and what you've experienced long into your future. That's why people still sort of recite scenes and, and have deep memories of the original Cosmos because of that depth of humanity and the depth of, of, of social concern for what role science can and should play in our society. So everything you said in that question is exactly what we've done on purpose for when we create Cosmos. And yes, I'm aware of it at every turn. Now, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, the, uh, you know, you know the young people starting to get into science, you know, these are going to be the scientists of the future. Uh, what do you by think? The way, by the way, uh, yes, yes, but even if they're not scientists of the future, if they're business people, attorneys, politicians, artists, I know in advance that they will be infused by an interest or a love of science, or at worst, Science is not something evil to them. It's just maybe they're just neutral to it. That way they don't play interference on it. So if you're an attorney and you like science, maybe you, and you like space, maybe you're going to be the first person to write the, the laws of, for asteroid mining. All right. Who owns an asteroid? Can you own an asteroid? Should you own an asteroid? Who owns the mineral rights? How does it get distributed? Is there some humanitarian dimension to that? if it's a bounty of wealth and of resources. So there are ways you can contribute to society, even if you don't become the scientist and engineer. How do you think uh, we, we can uh, keep encouraging those people, whether they do become scientists or become 
uh, uh, people in other fields who are engaged and open to, to science, you know, as they get older and, and they begin to take over the world and, and hopefully make it a better place. All right. So, so you, you didn't even ask the question the right way. <laughs> because it, your question assumed that without the encouragement, they won't do it. I claim that if you create an innovation nation where the country is actively involved in exploration, in discovery, in, in, in innovation, then you will not need to have programs to excite people about science. It'll be a fundamental part of life. In the same way, when we were going to the moon, you didn't need special programs to get people interested in becoming science teachers or in taking science classes. In fact, you had to beat them back at the door. So many people wanted to come in and participate. So when it is in the culture, you don't have to have a program to get people interested in it. The same thing happened with the modern sort of conservation movement. Uh, that started while we were going to the moon. We went to the moon to explore the moon, look back and discovered Earth for the first time. In 1970, right in the middle of the Apollo program, excuse me, in the middle of the Apollo missions to the moon, um, we founded the Environmental Protection Agency and NOAA and Earth Day was founded. And all of a sudden these TV commercials about protecting the environment came in. There's a famous ad where people are throwing garbage out their window and there's a Native American with a tear in his eye. Anyone over 45 knows that commercial. Um, it's, all that happened in that era. And, and this was a cultural movement that every, it was like a, a firmware upgrade in everybody's awareness of the importance of Earth after we had seen it from the moon. And that did not require special programs to get people interested. It was there. It was in the air. We were breathing it. And so I would claim that as these 35 and unders rise up, they will create a world where, of course, everyone is thinking about this. Of course, you'll make a movie uh, that has real science in it. And we'll have someone, I'm describing the Martian now, someone who will use science, technology, engineering, and math for his survival. All right? That Yes, that's just, that's in the air right now. And I... And I see no reason why it won't just continue without having to encourage people. Uh, well, I, I, I didn't I mean to jump all over your question. Not, not at all. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected at any moment by astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> uh, and I, I want to congratulate you again on, on Star Talk and on. on well, thank you. We're all very excited about it. In our, in our first year, uh, we were nominated for an Emmy for Best Informational Programming. And we hadn't, you know, we, we're not doing it for that purpose. We just thought we had a, a, a fun and, and interesting idea to develop. But uh, the Emmy nomination, though we didn't win, it was affirmation that s some people were paying attention to what we were doing. And I, I thought that was that was a good sign. Uh, and by the way, we lost to uh, Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown. So we had to lose to anybody, let it be Anthony Bourdain. Who doesn't love Anthony Bourdain? So uh, also we learned that Star Talk. Uh, you hinted at this at the beginning. Star Talk is the first ever science-based talk show on television. The first ever. And that is another sign that science is trending. Because otherwise, I don't control who puts this on television. There are people who make these decisions well above my pay scale, who say, well, we need to do this for these sponsors and this, that, and, and let's throw in a science talk show. All right? That's audacious, as National Geographic had initiated. But... Uh, the fact is, I think the the, the climate uh, is ripe for it. Well, I, I, I have high hopes for, for the show at the Emmys uh, this year as well. And uh, thank you very much for, for talking to me today. Okay, great. excellent. Thanks. Thanks for that interest.